Good morning. I think you will agree that we live in very testing times. Uh, people all over the world are being tested for the virus and uh, we're being tested every day by all the regulations, the limitations, the restrictions that are being placed upon our lives. We are restricted in our movement. We are told what to wear. We have to wear something over our face. We are told how to clean ourselves and uh, have good hygiene, who to visit, who we can gather with. And uh, I think we're very aware during these times of all the laws that have been promulgated and that apply to us to keep us uh, safe. And um, we always have a lot of laws, of course, a lot of rules, but we're not always that aware of them. And I want to share with you some theories, some laws, some rules of life that we have that govern our lives that we almost never really think about. Uh, for example, the law of gravity. Uh, we're all subject to the law of gravity, but we never think about it. We never think, boy, I must obey this law. Um, there's the law of if you wear white, if you dress yourself in white in the morning, before 9 o'clock you will spill some food on your clothes. There's the 5 second rule, or in some houses the 3 second rule. And you know the rule that uh, if you drop a piece of food on the ground, uh, little germs uh, and other creepy crawlies will not get onto that food for at least 5 seconds. So you're safe to pick it up and eat it. Or uh, a rule that I'm not sure is still around, but uh, I'm aware of it, and that's the bad things happen in threes. So if one thing bad thing happens and then another, you just know a third bad thing is going to happen. A law that uh, particularly irks me is the one that says the later you are for an appointment, the better your chances of running into red robots. Um, one law that I've become aware of during this lockdown period and doing these recordings is the law that your cell phone will ring during a recording. Uh, and so I've learned to put my cell phone off. Uh, another rule that we live by that applies to our lives is the washing of your car and the expectation of rain. You wash your car in the morning, the rule is it will rain in the afternoon. And then the rule that whatever you drop, whatever you drop will roll away into the most inaccessible spot on the floor. And of course that rule correlates with age. The older you get, the truer that rule is. And then lastly there's the I'm not superstitious but rule. And you know how this works. If you see a ladder and you can pass underneath the ladder or you can pass around the ladder, uh, you will pass around it because you'll say, well, I'm not superstitious, but you know, let's not tempt fate. And these rules and many others like them are just part of our life, just part of who we are. And John, in his first letter, focuses on three aspects of Christianity, three basics that are absolute but are part of our faith, part of who we are as Christians. And he's writing about these three aspects because there were false teachers who came into the church in that time, just as in any time of the church's existence. And they were saying one thing while the apostles were saying something else. And John is saying, here's how you recognize genuine Christians. Three things, if you want to recognize a genuine Christian. Faith in Jesus, doing what is right, and loving each other. And these are our tests if we want to see who's a, a genuine Christian. These are our affirmations. If we sometimes wonder about ourselves, we use these to affirm our faith. And so they apply to our lives as Christians. And John says they're absolutely basic to who we are. Let's read uh, about some testing times in 1 John 4, the first six verses. He says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. 
This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. In this world, there are truth and lies. And you're always going to have that. Truth and falsehood. And when it comes to Jesus as well, some people will tell you lies and some people will share with you truth. And as a Christian, you need to know the difference between lies and truth. In fact, John is actually saying to us, a believer, a real believer, knows when to be an unbeliever. Knows when to not believe. Look at verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe. Be an unbeliever when it comes to this. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So there are times that you want to be an unbeliever. Because not everything you hear is truth. We are living in testing times. And John is saying to us, don't accept everything. Even when it comes to Jesus, or perhaps especially when it comes to Jesus. See, there's a time for us as people, for us as Christians, to be narrow-minded. It's not always good to be open-minded. It's good for us to be discerning. See, some people think uh, for a Christian, you've got to be open-minded. You've got to be tolerant. You've got to be accepting, non-judgmental. Don't judge anybody. Don't be that mean. Don't be like that. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4, But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different spirit than the one you received, or a different gospel than the one you believed. Now notice he says there are different Jesus and different gospels and different spirit. They, they come and teach you a Jesus. They come and teach you a spirit. They come and teach you a gospel. And it's it's almost like the real thing. It's just a little different. See, no one comes and says, well, I'm not going to preach Jesus. I'm going to preach something completely different. All right? They don't announce, I'm a heresy, and I'm, I'm a heretic, and I'm coming with heresy. They don't announce that. They don't say, I'm a false teacher. Here's some false doctrine for you. They just take the truth and they twist it. They just make it somewhat different. In fact, later in the same chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, these people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I am not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Now, two things you've got to know. Satan will do whatever he can to deceive. All right? He may make it look good. It may sound right. But you've got to test it. Because Satan is hiding around every corner trying to deceive you. And you need to understand, Satan is behind every false doctrine. He's the sponsor of false doctrine. Look at what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, that's the times we are living in, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from Demons are right? teachings that come from demons. See, there's false teaching in this world. There's a lot of false teaching in this world, and you need to understand Satan is behind it. And the reason Satan is behind it is because salvation is found in Jesus alone. In other words, salvation from the clutches of Satan, from the consequences of sin, that, that whole realm of Satan where Satan wants us to be, salvation from that, is found in Jesus. So obviously, false teaching is going to attack Jesus. Satan is going to attack Jesus. And so that's the first point. The deceiver attacks Jesus. A believer knows when to be an unbeliever. 
because he knows the deceiver will come sooner or later and try to attack Jesus. Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And so false teachers in some way or another, they're going to attack him. And again, not blatantly, not obviously, but just kind of blurring your focus a little bit, shifting Jesus just out of center, just off center. Okay, but however he does it, it's still an attack on Jesus. In fact, false teaching attacks in three ways. You need to be uh, aware of these three ways, discerning of these three, these three ways in which uh, Satan will attack um, uh, Jesus. First of all, false teaching will attack his claim to uniqueness. Okay? Deceivers will come and they will attack the claim of Jesus to uniqueness and say, he's not unique, he's not the only one, he's not the son of God. He's not God in the flesh. All right? He's not the Messiah, the anointed one sent by the Creator God. Look at uh, verses 2 and 3 in the message of 1 John 4. Here's how you test for the genuine Spirit of God. Everyone who confesses openly his faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came as an actual flesh and blood person, comes from God and belongs to God. And everyone who refuses to confess faith in Jesus has nothing in common with God. So if you don't confess Jesus, you have nothing in common with God. Now, people like this may be moral. False teachers may, may sound reasonable. They may, may seem very sophisticated, very nice. In fact, uh, false teachers can be very nice, lovable people. All right? But that's not the test. That's not the test. The test is, what do they say about Jesus. Karl Barth was lecturing at uh, Princeton University and a student asked him, don't you think that God has revealed himself in many other religions apart from Christianity? And Karl Barth said to the student, no, God has not revealed himself in any religion including Christianity. God has revealed himself in his son Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus is unique, or as John puts it, he's the one and only. All right? And because he's the one and only, the one and only way to God, they will attack his uniqueness. Secondly, they will attack his offer of righteousness. Not just are they going to attack the supremacy of the Son of God, but also his sufficiency as the only true way to God. Verses 2 and 3 again of 1 John 4. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Now the NIV uses that word acknowledge there. All right? But it's not the, the, the greatest translation. The Greek word means to confess. It's that word we've heard before, homologeo. All right? To say the same thing, to agree, to declare openly, to say, God, I confess your view. I agree with your view. I agree with your truth, with what you say. And you confess Jesus is the only way. You confess Jesus has come in the flesh. All right? And he came in the flesh so that he could die and sacrifice himself so that by God's grace, by that sacrifice, I can be saved. And I put my faith in nothing else. We need to understand the message of the cross really is uh, scandalous. It's a scandalous message. You know, because uh, what it says to us is you're dead in your sin. You're dead in your sin. You're dead because of your sin. And you're in a hopeless state. You have no righteousness. You have no righteous deeds. You have no righteous anything to offer God. And so what Satan then does, what the deceiver then does, he comes along and he gives a different gospel that appeals to our human pride because that message of sin, we don't like that very much. All right? We like we are the, 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 the message where we can actually do something about whatever state we find ourselves in. We like the, the, the fact that we can count on our own righteousness. That, that uh, you know, for us to be made right with, with God... Uh, of course, Jesus is great. We have him in the picture, of course. Uh, you can't do without him. Um, but we add that very, very insidious t 
teaching that you can add to his effort with your own effort. You take his sacrifice, you kind of make that your uh, focal point, but then you add to it, and what you're actually doing, you're kind of pushing it off center a bit because you're adding your own effort and focusing on your own effort and saying that own effort is needed. Paul said to Timothy, remember, that's a demonic doctrine. It's a demonic doctrine. It's the doctrine that's a teaching of demons, of Satan. He's the sponsor of that kind of teaching. That's why Paul is so hard on the Galatians, why he's so... Um, uses such strong language when he says a person like that that wants to add anything to, the, to, to Jesus is accursed. A person like that is accursed. See, we receive the righteousness of Jesus. Not our own righteousness at all. We receive the righteousness of Jesus. We receive it by God's grace. And it's through faith in Jesus. In fact, that's what the New Testament is all about. That's the teaching of the New Testament in a nutshell. Uh, let me just share with you one passage. There's so many others that I could have picked. But Romans 3, 20-23. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace. It's an amazing passage. It's saying you are not saved by keeping the law. You are not saved by keeping a law. You are not saved by keeping a single pinpoint of any law. Okay? You, don't, you are not declared righteous by anything that you do. You are declared righteous by the grace of God through your faith in Jesus. It's given to those who believe in Jesus. His righteousness is given to those who believe. If you go and you add 1% to Jesus Christ, then you are 100% wrong. It's His righteousness. And we live out His righteousness. And then the third way the deceiver attacks. Um, deceivers will attack His call to holiness. His call to holiness. Part of the gospel, part of this good news, is that we are made new. We are given a new life, a new life in which we are enabled, empowered by the Spirit to do right, to live holy lives. And false teachers come and they try and play that down. Look at what John says in verse 5 of our passage today. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. See, Satan is smart. Okay, Satan's very smart. He knows what people want. See, many people call themselves Christian, and then they want what the world wants. All right? And to have that, to be like everybody else, to still fit in, you've got to water down holiness. In other words, holiness is no longer the absolute that it should be when you think of a holy God, a perfect God. Okay? You have to water that down. Now, how do you do that in such a way that you think you can uh, get away with it? Well, grace. You pervert grace. All right? uh, and so you start thinking to yourself, well, this grace is wonderful. All right? Because uh, it, it allows... Right? It allows certain things. I mean, uh, I'm just going to sin and grace is going to allow it because I'm covered by grace. Just like the people that uh, in Rome that Paul wrote to in chapter 6 thought. Um, just, you know, by the by, when you if, you, if you think that grace allows, it does. It allows you to be stronger. It grows you more and more holy because that grace, grace is simply God working in us, strengthening us. Um, sanctifying us. And so then what you have is some people add to Jesus and they pervert His offer of righteousness. Some people come and take away from Jesus and they pervert and they distort His standard of holiness. Jude 3 and 4 Defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to His holy people. 
I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. They have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. See, if you dismiss sin, you dismiss Jesus. You dismiss the cross and that sacrifice, that love of God. He watered down obedience, and that's the doctrine, the teaching of demons. And Satan can do that and make it look good, make it look appetizing. Satan specializes in calling darkness light. If you look around you in the world, Satan is so good at that. He's good at, at uh, taking evil and making it acceptable. Not only acceptable, he makes it look desirable. People want that, but I need that in my life because that's going to make my life more complete. And too many churches, too many Christians follow the deceiver into obedience. They, they allow themselves to slip into unholiness. But we need to understand other unholiness, that's not who we are. That's not who we are. See, there's a reason he is called the Holy Spirit. Any spirit that leads you away from holy is not the Holy Spirit. If a spirit comes, if a teaching comes, and it leads you away from holiness, you can know for a fact it's not the Holy Spirit. 1 John 3, 7 and 8. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. And so again, John is very absolute. You have holiness, doing right, walking in step with the Holy Spirit, or you have doing what is wrong, evil, being of the devil. See, Jesus did not come and die for you as a sinner so that you can remain where you are, so that you can just kind of carry on with your life as before. Jesus gave his life for us so that we can escape that and we can live new, abundant, holy lives. He, Jesus died for us so that the Holy Spirit can shape holiness in us and that we can live holy lives. We can live lives of godliness. In other words, as John puts it, we can live lives of knowing God. In fact, Jesus said that, didn't he? He said, this is eternal life. This is what it's all about, knowing God. And so a receiver of truth a receiver of truth knows God. See, John was dealing with false teachers who were coming into the church and saying, they know God. They know God. They've got special knowledge of God. And John says, no, no, no. They do not know God. They don't know Him because they don't receive truth. Verse 6. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. He's talking about John the Apostles and the Apostles. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. In other words, you've got to know God. A receiver of truth knows God. He makes a real connection with God. He enters into a real intimate relationship with God. That's what know means. It's, it's having an intimacy with the Father in heaven. And only somebody from God, who knows God, can do that. All right, You've got to be born of God for that to happen. It's interesting, in this passage, in these few verses, he says, from God, six times. He mentions that six times, from God. In other words, the fact that we are born of God, that we are born of the Holy Spirit. He says, the true Spirit is from God, and that only those who receive the true Spirit is from God. Only someone who is born again can receive truth. Truth is from the Spirit. He's the Spirit of truth. And so he's received by those who are born of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, 12-14 We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. See, real Christians know when they are hearing truth and when they're hearing lies. And the reason they do is because they have God's Spirit of truth indwelling them and they are led by the Holy 
spirit. And that's such an important aspect of our lives because we live in testing times. We are being tested by false teaching, false teaching that is all around us. And this false teaching comes and it tests our commitment to Jesus, to Jesus the one and only. So whenever anybody speaks about Jesus, test them, test the speaker, test their teaching. Don't just think, wow, they're a wonderfully anointed speaker. I love what they say. I love how they say it. I'm just going to accept it. We've got to test speakers. We've got to test their messages. And we've got to test our hearing and say, are we discerning enough? Am I discerning enough? Am I happy just to listen to anything anybody tells me? Or am I committed to the faith once for all delivered to God's holy people? Won't you pray with me? Father, we live in a world in which Satan is pushing his lies. He's pumping his propaganda into all areas of life, Father, even into the church. And I pray for sunrise. I pray for every Christian in sunrise that we will know you so deeply, Father, that when the least shadow of falsehood arises, it will offend us. We will know it immediately. Father, help us to be well versed in your word. I pray, Father, in a very practical way for all of us that you will enable us every day, Father. You will inspire us through your Holy Spirit every day to pick up that word of life, that your word, the Bible, and, and make it part of who we are so that we can know Scripture, we can know the Spirit of Truth, we can know your will, we can know your way, and we can live it and go forth in such a way, Father, that false teaching will never be able to deceive us and lead us astray. Thank you for the Logos. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for His Spirit of Truth that indwells us. Amen.